In 1957's 12 Angry Men, 12 jurors deliberate the guilt of an 18-year-old boy on trial for murdering his father. In the first episode of this series, we study the characteristics that can help you to convince those who disagree with you to change their mind. In the second episode, we analyze the ways in which a debate can be conducted in order to make it as productive as possible. In this episode, we'll focus on how to pick your battles, when it would be wise to confront an opponent, and when it would not be wise. It is to be expected, when you take part in a debate, that somebody is going to say something that you disagree with. And when that happens, you'll have to decide whether it is worth confronting that individual to contest that particular point or not. It would be foolish to contest every point. You do have to make some concessions in a debate. But naturally, it wouldn't be a debate if you conceded everything. You do have to contest an argument that you do not agree with eventually. So, when should you yield? When should you fight? And why is it so important to make the right call? Well, to answer the last question, a debate is very much like a game of chess. You not only have to make a series of many good decisions, just one bad decision could ruin you. Attack the wrong piece or strike too soon, and you may only make it easier for your opponent to defeat you. You could say that you reap what you sow. Consider the following exchange between juror number 12 and juror number 3. Frankly, I don't see how you can vote for acquittal. It's not so easy to arrange all the evidence in order. And... You can throw out all the other evidence. The woman saw him do it. What else do you want? After number 4 makes an argument in favor of a guilty verdict, number 12 argues that he is unable in that moment to decide whether or not the boy is guilty because there's too much evidence to consider in order to make a quick decision. Number 3 decides to contest this point by insisting that all of the evidence could be disregarded with the only exception being one eyewitness's testimony. Alright, I'm changing my vote. He's guilty. And this works out for number three. In the short term, number 12 promptly changes his vote back to guilty. But when the testimony of that particular eyewitness is called into question and deemed unreliable, number three makes the following argument. But what about all the other evidence? What about all that stuff, the, the, the knife, the, the whole business? Well, you said we could throw out all the other evidence. It's just like in a game of chess. When you move one of your pieces on the board, you cannot undo that move. You have to bear the consequences of that maneuver. Similarly, when number three argues that only one piece of evidence matters, he unfortunately finds himself backed into a corner when that one piece of evidence is revealed to not be credible. In hindsight, this was the wrong fight to pick. Now, obviously, no one can see into the future to know for sure whether or not they're picking the right battles, so you're going to need some sort of standard for deciding this. One of the easiest rules of thumb would be to ask yourself if it's possible to challenge an opponent's point on a purely factual basis. Meaning, is it possible to challenge what they said without even making an argument, but by simply stating a cold, hard fact? Here are a few examples of one of the jurors being challenged with a fact and nothing else. I just think he's guilty. I thought it was obvious from the word go. I mean, nobody proved otherwise. Nobody has to prove otherwise. The burden of proof's on the prosecution. His window was right opposite hers across the L tracks, and she swore she saw him do it. Through the windows of a passing L train. Right. And they proved in court that at night you can look through the windows of an L train when the lights are out and see what's happening on the other side. Well, I was wondering how clearly the old man could have heard the boy's voice through the ceiling. Didn't hear it through the ceiling. The window was open. So was the one upstairs. It was a hot night, remember? Did the old man say he ran to the door? Ran? Walked? What's the difference? He got on, did he? I mean, he got there, didn't no, he? No, well, wait a second. Well, he said he ran. At least I think he did. Look, I don't remember what he said, but I don't see how he could have run to the door. He said he went from his bedroom to the front door. He's a common ignorant slob. He don't even speak good English. He doesn't even speak good English. The hallmark of any good debate is one where everyone has their facts right. If your opponent omits a fact or states something that is not a fact, it's virtually always worth confronting them. 
and you don't necessarily need to construct an argument to do so. Just state the facts. The reason why this is a smart strategy in a debate is not just because it's worth being correct, but also because it's the least likely strategy to make the confrontation personal. A confrontation that turns personal is one of the worst things that can happen in a debate. It's not just something that should be avoided as a matter of principle. Making a confrontation in a debate personal bears consequences that can hurt you more than your opponent. During the deliberation, juror number 10 makes an offensive remark about people who were born and raised in slums. This without the knowledge that juror number 5 was born and raised in a slum. The kids who crawl out of these places are real trash. I don't want any part of them, I'm telling you. Listen, I, uh, I've lived in a slum all my life. Well, I mean, wait, wait a wait, minute. Shh, please, I, I played in backyards and were filled with garbage. I mean, maybe you can still smell it on me. Now listen, Sonny. Come on now, there's nothing personal. Oh, no, there was some oh, personal. Come on, fella, he didn't mean you. Let's not be so sensitive. How does personally offending juror number five inhibit juror number 10? Well, for one thing, number five becomes one of the first jurors to change his vote to not guilty, which is politically damaging for number 10, considering he's one of the most vocal members of the quote-unquote guilty party. But it also results in number five becoming one of the most vocal members of the not guilty party, regularly fighting back when an opponent contests one of his allies. You'll notice, for the rest of the picture, most of number 10's attempts to fight an opponent are intercepted by number five. Well, did or didn't he? He says he did. Says he did? Boy, how do you like that? Now look, witnesses can make mistakes. Sure, when you want them to, they do. It's How's come you're the only one in this room who wants to see exhibits all the time? I want to see this one too. Why didn't his lawyer bring it up of its own court? Well, maybe he just didn't think about it. What do you it, mean huh? didn't think of it? Did you think a man's an idiot or something? It's an obvious thing. Did hey, you think of listen, it? Listen, smart guy, don't matter whether I thought of it. Look, this is absolutely insane. What are you wasting everybody's time in here for? Look, according to you, it'll only take 15 seconds. Now, we can spare that, see? Number five makes a continuous effort to undermine number 10. All of this could have been potentially avoided if number 10 had just not personally offended number five to start with. Because he did, even though it was by accident, he pays a price. This makes for a good example of why you shouldn't try to win a debate with personal criticisms. Not only will you squander any chance of winning over those who get caught in the crosshairs, they might just dedicate themselves to bopping you over the head every time you speak. Okay, so you should never pick a personal fight, and you should always pick a factual fight. But what do you do when your disagreement is not personal, nor factual, but rational? What if you disagree with an opponent's argument? Well, that depends on how reasonable of an argument they make, and ultimately, that comes down to your own judgment. But a good example of what it looks like to yield to a counterargument occurs when number four challenges number eight early on. Number eight argues that the boy being slapped by his father was not a very strong motive for murdering his father. This boy's been hit so many times in his life that violence is practically a, it's a normal state of affairs with him. I just, I can't see two slaps in the face provoking him into committing murder. It may have been two too many. Everyone has a breaking point. Number eight does not contest number four's point. Frankly, number four made a good point. It was the right thing to do for number eight to yield, and just as with correcting factual errors or avoiding personal criticisms, this is not merely the right thing to do as a matter of principle. There are practical reasons. It's a game of chess. Each move either gives you an advantage or a disadvantage. If number eight had fought number four on this particular point this early on, the jury's verdict may have never changed. He would have lost the war just to win this battle. It wasn't worth the the fight and he knew that. So when does number eight think that it is worth fighting back? Well, there are two answers, and both of them are kind of obvious when he's made a better argument and or his argument is not properly challenged. Fast forward to this moment when number eight puts two pieces of testimony together. One of the witnesses, the old man, claimed to have heard the killing and heard the boy scream, I'm going to kill you. But the other witness, the woman across the street, claimed to have seen the killing just as an elevated train went by. Based on this, number eight argues that the old man couldn't have possibly possibly heard the boy scream anything if an L train was going by at the same time. The old man, according to his own testimony, I'm going to kill you, body hitting the floor a split second later, 
would have had to hear the boy make this statement with the yell roaring past his nose. It's not possible he could have heard it. That's idiotic, of course he heard it. Do you it. think he could have heard it? He said he yelled at the top of his voice. That's good enough for me. Even if he heard something, he still couldn't have identified the voice with the yell roaring by. You're talking about a matter of seconds. Nobody can be that accurate. Well, I think testimony that could put a boy into the electric chair should be that accurate. This time, number eight was right to fight back against number three, whereas number three was wrong to pick a fight with number eight. Number eight made a reasonable argument, and number three did not properly challenge it. First, he calls number eight's argument idiotic. Next, he stubbornly insists that the boy screaming at the top of his voice was good enough for him, to which number eight smartly grants that point just for the sake of argument, but then argues that the voice could not have possibly been identified. Finally, number three barks about how no testimony could ever be accurate enough for number eight to do what he just did. At no point does number three ever try to properly address number eight's argument. All he really tries to do is make the argument seem stupid, and it doesn't work. Once again, number three picked the wrong fight. What's the matter with you guys? You all know he's guilty. He's got to burn. You're letting him slip through our fingers. Slip through our fingers? Are you his executioner? I'm one of them. Perhaps you'd like to pull the switch. One of the most dramatic moments in this picture occurs when juror number eight sets an example for one of the riskiest maneuvers one can make in a debate. You'll recall that we've already established how avoiding personal criticisms is a good rule of thumb, so what you're about to watch is not recommended. Ever since you walked into this room, you've been acting like a self-appointed public avenger. You want to see this boy die because you personally want it, not because of the facts. You're a sadist. <laughs> The reason why this is not recommended is because it, it's just too great of a gamble. Attempting to undermine an individual's character can severely backfire if done at the wrong time, in the wrong way, or against the wrong person. If number eight had done this to a more popular or sympathetic member of the jury, he would have damaged his own reputation. If number three didn't react the way he did, number eight would have appeared to be the aggressor. If number five, number six, and number seven didn't physically hold number three back, this figurative fight would have become a literal fight, and once somebody gets punched in the nose, the debate is over. So again, it is not recommended that you pick this particular kind of fight. It can be effective, it can play out in your favor, but if it doesn't, it could cost you the entire debate, so you really shouldn't prepare for it. Hopefully, you now have a better idea, or a better standard, of how to decide when you should concede and when you should contest during a debate.